Good morning. This is uh, another series in the series on uh, Genesis, but I'm going to take a few minutes to try to orient you to where I'm going and what's coming, because we'll be out of Genesis before long, and uh, it won't make much sense to record the lessons in no order of numbers in Genesis. So let me let me spend a few minutes on on that kind of thing father thank you so much for this study thank you and open our hearts and our minds and we ask in jesus name amen now here's what i call a bible study roadmap uh, it may not be clear to some of you where we're going with this study. So this is a, kind of an overview outline. We have studied creation, authority, power, and sin, the problem of life and death, and the overriding problem. Uh, the problem, of course, is that... Uh, for whatever, for many reasons, the the death of Adam and Eve spiritually required, uh, among other things, the spiritual death of a person. But after they died, then uh, all p people were born dead spiritually, and there was no one who could be put to death. Uh, uh, and to fulfill God's sense of justice. And so we're left without a possible uh, person to do that. And now we are, we are involved in studying uh, what I call working out the solution. Now what I'm going to do, and what I mean by that, is we'll be looking at the steps that God will go through in order to get around this insurmountable problem. We are doing this because we are interested in it, because we want to know what God did to set up the solution, not because he needs our advice or anything of that sort. He doesn't need us for that. But in order to learn some things and, uh, and follow what he did. Now, in the process, we're going to come across people who misbehaved. And I want to make it clear, we are looking at what God did to create a solution to the problem. Some of the people will do unsavory things and even evil things and do not mistake that God. this is God's plan to create evil in order to accomplish an end. He simply knows that these people are going to behave in a certain way and he will use that as part of the plan to overcome the solution. So we're going to be out of Genesis pretty soon, and uh, we'll be in scattered places in the Bible, and watch out for that. I will come up with a system to number the lessons that won't be Genesis number and so-and-so, because we may not always be in Genesis. So let's go on from there. We'll, you can see uh, what working this, working out the solution entails, and we are presently involved in choosing a people. God will ultimately make the nation of Israel, and He's going to choose people according to what He needs done. Not that he will make them do anything wrong, but he knows if they do, and he can, he will use that to make choices. 
So let's go on with that. And I'll show you this roadmap periodically so we can keep things straight. I will also sometimes simply summarize a whole chapter if it uh, has something interesting uh, that happens, but not extremely important to the flow of God's plan. And this is uh, the case in Genesis chapter 16. Abram and Sarai uh, were frustrated. They had been promised a great nation. They had been promised a son. And there was nothing yet was forthcoming. So they decided to help God out, which is generally a bad idea. So uh, Sarah came up with the idea that she would give her maid, her Egyptian maid, Hagar, to Abram. And then he would have a baby, and uh, that baby then could sit on the lap of, uh, of Sarah, and she would simply adopt it as her own. And this way they would help God get on with the family. So the result was uh, a child came forth named Ishmael. And he was the ancestor of most of the Arabs of today. And God describes what he will be like. He says he will be a wild donkey of a man. And we regret very much that he uh, came forth. So let's move on to Genesis chapter 17. Abraham was 99 years old. And so the Lord appeared to him and said, I'm God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you and I will multiply you exceedingly. Now one of the things going on here is the gradual establishment of the Abrahamic covenant with a series of promises and expansions on the, uh, on the covenant. So now he says, I, I, I told you I was going to give you a son and now I will multiply you exceedingly. As for me, God saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you will be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. And Abraham means the father of nations. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. Now, this is God's purpose to do that. It hasn't happened yet, but when God proposes purposes to do something, then he will consider it done, even though in what we call real time, it hasn't happened yet. I'll make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make nations of you. Kings will come forth from you. Now, that's an interesting statement because the original intent, so far as we know, was that, that this would be a theocracy. That is, the head of everything would be God, and God would deal directly with the people. Sin interfered with that, with the resulting death of Adam and Eve, and the loss of uh, their dominion over the earth. And so here, in fact, because we're later going to hear about kings, in fact, he says, kings will come forth from you, but not right now. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. Now, this is something else added to the covenant. We weren't sure before whether it was a temporary covenant, whether it was unilateral or bilateral or what. But now, 
we know it's going to be an everlasting covenant. It will hold forth forever. I'll give to you and your descendants after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So now we know that there is land involved, uh, and well as people. But God said further to Abraham, Now as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you, throughout their generations. This is going to be an everlasting co covenant, remember. This is my covenant, which you shall keep, between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you you. Um, and uh, I think it's an important point, it's a fine point, but the, the circumcision is not by itself a covenant. It is a sign of the covenant that Abraham and all the male descendants are going to be circumcised and that will be evidence that they have entered into this covenant which we call the Abrahamic covenant and that is a sign uh, the presence of circumcision and every male among you who is eight years old shall be circumcised throughout your generations and a servant who is born in the house, or who is bought with money from any foreigner, who is not of your descendants, a servant born in your house, or bought with your money, shall surely be circumcised. Thus shall my covenant be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. Now let's pause just a minute and talk about the eight days. The explanation for that... Uh, appears to be on two fronts. Number one, that was uh, during a time when a newborn baby is, does not have a fully developed uh, clotting system. And for that, because of that, if you cut the newborn baby, he may well bleed to death. Now, we don't practically hold to the eight days these days. Those who circumcise the babies do it earlier than that, but they also give them vitamin K. And with, with the excess vitamin K, the slotting system matures much more rapidly so that the circumcision can take place. Eight days allow the, the clotting system to mature to the point that it was not particularly dangerous to do a circumcision at eight days. The second front is that it seemed to be a custom among the Jews, an attitude that a newborn baby was uh, sort of on probation. For the first week of life, it was not sure that this baby is going to make it and therefore would not be brought into the covenant position until you're sure than at birth that the baby is going to survive. And so the the uh, circumcision took place after the first week of life, that is on the eighth day. And this makes the, the circumcision a mandatory sign. An uncircumcised male who's not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin 
that person shall be cut off from his people. He's broken my covenant. Now, cut off in this instance means killed. He has broken the covenant and he will be put to death. And then God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I'll bless her. Indeed, I will give you a son by her. Then I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people will come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Will a child be born to a man a hundred years old? And will Sarah, who's ninety years old, bear us child? Right? If you're interested in, in ages, uh, uh, look at this. Uh, uh, a child be born to a man a hundred years old, and Sarah, who's ninety years old, so there's about a ten-year difference in their age for whatever that's worth to you. And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. He's gone to the trouble to have a child with Hagar, and he wants Ishmael to be important. But God said, No, but Sarah, your wife, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. As for Ishmael, I've heard you. Behold, I'll bless him. I will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall become the father of twelve princes and I will make him a great nation. But, my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you at this season next year. Now that we know that, uh, that uh, Ishmael is going to be a... Uh, Big deal. Let's move on to chapters 18 and 19. We know from before that Sodom uh, uh, and Gomorrah are, are full of evil people. And they are so evil that God decides that he was, is going to destroy those two uh, cities. But since he considers Abraham his friend, he wants to warn him about that. And uh, there's an interchange about how many righteous people in, in Sodom would save the city and so on. But the agreement is that he will delay the destruction of the cities until Lot and his family are moved. Yeah, the two angels that appeared along with the Lord go to Sodom to tell uh, Lot to get out with his family. Yeah, they're not very anxious to leave. And we discover that the men of Sodom want to have sexual relationship with the two angels. The angels uh, struck them with blindness to prevent all of that. And a kind of a disgusting thing where instead of the two angels, Lot offers him his, offers the men of Sodom his two daughters. At any rate, they finally are hastened out of the city. And Lot's wife looks back at where she had lived and because of that is turned into a pillar of salt. Now, they're leaving for a little town called Zoar up in the mountains because, uh, because Lot says he's afraid to live in the plains. So when they get to Zoar and the, uh, the two cities are destroyed in what seems like a, a, probably a nuclear holocaust, 
we guess, I guess, that the two daughters thought all of the people on the earth were destroyed and that uh, the uh, continuation of mankind depends upon them. They cooked up a plan, they got a lot drunk, and then each one in turn uh, lay with him at night, and out of that came two babies, one called Moab and the other called Ben-Ami, and these are the ancestors of two tribes, Moabites and Ammonites, that uh, brought great brief to the, the Israelites in the future. Now, Abraham does it again. Chapter 20, he and his... Uh, his wife, Sarah, go to the Philistines uh, and they, end in the, they run into Abimelech, the king of Gerar, one of the Philistine cities. Now notice that Abimelech is not so much a name as it is a title. So it's the title of one of the kings of uh, the Philistines. And um, Abraham tells uh, Abimelech that Sarah is his sister to avoid possibly getting killed by somebody who wants to take his wife. And uh, the Lord warns Abimelech about that and says, don't do it, she's his wife. And so Abraham is thrown out in disgrace and scolding but is given some more cattle. So uh, this has happened again. Abraham can't manage to consistently tell the truth. Now, in chapter 21, um, we're going to do this in more detail. Sarah conceived and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the appointed time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, who Sarah, who Sarah bore, to, bore to him, Isaac. Then Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Now Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, mocking. Therefore she said to Abraham, Drive this maid and her son, for the son of this maid shall not be an heir with my son Isaac. And the matter distressed Abraham greatly because of his son Ishmael. But God said to Abraham, do not be distressed because of the lad and your maid. Whatever Sarah tells you, listen to her, for through Isaac your descendants shall be named. And of the son of the maid I will make a nation also, because he's her, he is your descendant. Now, I'm not going to spend any time on this, but this is the descendants of Ishmael. And as promised, he's got a dozen kids. Uh, uh, none of them are particularly important to us at this point, and so I'm not going to take any time with this. This just shows that God kept his promise. And then it came behind Genesis 22. This is a particularly important section. It came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. And he said, Take now your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. Now notice that he says, Isaac is your only son. Well, 
Abraham has made a push for Ishmael, but he says, this is your only son and the one you love, and I want you to go make an offering of him, a burnt offering, on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. So Abraham arose early in the morning. He didn't complain about it or try to argue. Saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son. He split wood for the burnt offering, arose, and went to the place of which God had told him. And on the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go over there. And we will worship and return to you. He just can't bring himself to tell his servants that he is going up on the mountain to sacrifice Isaac. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. The son got to carry his own wood to his sacrifice. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked home together. Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father? And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself, the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. Now this, I want to call your attention to what's in blue here. Uh, this is the New American Standard translation. The King James and a number of other translations say that, that God will provide himself not for himself, but will provide himself the lamb for the burnt offering. And now, we don't know how much to make of that, whether this is a, a, a forecast, a, a prophecy of what is going to come to pass in the form of God's only son that he loved. But we... Just note the interest and let it go at that for the moment. So Abraham stretched out his hand and put, took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He, the angel, said, Do not stretch out your hand against the lad. And do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Now, let me point out an incidental thing here. You notice the angel of the Lord. Now, in the Old Testament, if you look very carefully at many passages, you will find that the term, the angel of the Lord, means the Lord himself. That's not true in the New Testament, but it seems to be true in the Old Testament. So when you see the term angel of the Lord, you think the Lord himself. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked. And behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram, offered him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son. Now, people have, this is certainly not, not uh, original with me, but look at that. Uh, he saw a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. Now, rams are professional thicket runners. 
And to think that this is simply a coincidence that a ram caught himself by his horns in the thicket. I don't think so. I think God engineered this ram being here and engineered him getting caught by his horns. So Abraham, verse 14, <clears throat> called the name of that place. The Lord will provide. We know it as Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day in the mount of the Lord, it will be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, and let me note in passing that the code is here broken, the angel of the Lord calling a second time from heaven, and he says, I have sworn by myself, declares the Lord. The code is broken. This angel of the Lord calling from heaven is the Lord himself. Indeed, I will greatly bless you. I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore and your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Now notice that this is uh, a practical consummation and final uh, uh, putting in place of the Abrahamic covenant that not only has Abraham been charged with righteousness because he believed the Lord, he has now obeyed him to the point that he was willing to sacrifice his only son the one he loved at the command of the Lord. And in Genesis 23, this is important and we're going to go through it, but word comes that uh, two births have occurred. There's, there's Isaac. He's, he's probably a young adult now. And don't mistake the, that when uh, Abraham was going to sacrifice him, that he was a baby or something. He was old enough to know what was going on. Probably over not old enough that he could have overwhelmed his father had he chosen to. But he, like his father, um, was simply obedient to the wishes of the Lord. But word comes that <clears throat> relatives up in Haran, Nahor and Milcah, have now had an, a daughter. And that daughter is named Rebecca. Now Rebecca is going to play a part in the quest for a people. Abraham said to his servant, uh, we're in chapter 24, the oldest, the servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all he owned, take your, place your hand under my thigh. This is a, a means for promising that he will do what he says he'll do. And I'll make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven, God of earth, you shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I live, but you shall go to my country and my relatives and take a wife for my son Isaac. Now remember that after they left the Ur of the Chaldees, most of the family uh, 
stopped in Haran and Isaac, not, I'm sorry, and Abraham and Sarah and Lot both went on down to Canaan. And Abraham does not want his son Isaac to take a wife from among the Canaanites. The servant said to him, Suppose a woman not willing to follow me. Should I take your son back to the land from where you came? Abraham said, Beware that you do not take my son back there. I do not want my son to have a wife from among the Canaanites. The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my birth, who spoke to me and swore to me, saying, To your descendants I will give this land. He will send his angel before you, and you will take a wife for my son from there. The servant took ten camels, set out with a variety of good things of his masters in his hand. He arose and went to Mesopotamia to the city of Nahor. Now that's Haran. Nahor is the, the relative, and he lives in Haran up to the north. Made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water at evening time, the time when women go out to draw water. And that was a custom that if you went to an unfamiliar land, the thing to do is... Uh, Go and listen and talk to the women at the time they draw water in the evening. And there you can learn things about the people and the city and so on. Now, may it be that the girl to whom I say, Please let down your jar so I may drink, and who answers, Drink and I'll water your camels also. May she be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. And by this I'll know you have shown loving kindness to my master. Before he had finished speaking, behold, Rebekah, who was born to Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Abraham's brother Nahor, came out with her jar on her shoulder. Girl, very beautiful, a virgin. No man had had relations with her. She went down to the spring and filled her jar and came up. And the servant ran to meet her and said, Please let me drink a little water from your jar. She said, Drink, my lord. And she quickly lowered her jar in her hand and gave him a drink. Now when she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw also for your camels until they have finished drinking. And said, Who, and the servant said, Whose daughter are you? Please tell me, is there room for you us to large in your father's house? She said to him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, whom he bore to Nahor. She bore to Nahor. Again she said to him, we have plenty of both straw and feed and room to lodge in. Then the man, the servant, bowed low and worshipped the Lord. I'm going to stop there. I wanted to get to this point before we stopped, and I took a little extra time at the beginning. But now we'll stop and we will take the story up here to continue the seeking of a people. Father, thank you so much that you work out this, this solution to this awful problem. We're fascinating. It's fascinating for us to see how you did it. And we hope to learn great things from it. But now go with us, Father, and keep us safe in this pandemic. For we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen.